Preaching is one of the most important themes throughout the Gospel of Mark. Mark opens his Gospel with a short description of John the Immerser and his ministry, referring to Old Testament prophecies that predict a coming messenger, a voice crying in the wilderness. And then he describes how John preached a baptism of repentance and preached about a greater man to come. Then he recounts Jesus' baptism by John, breathes over Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, and opens his record of Jesus' ministry with verses 14 and 15 of Mark chapter 1, where the Bible says, Jesus came to Galilee after John was put in prison, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In verses 21 through 39, as we talked about Monday night, we have recorded for us a day in the life of Jesus. He heals some people. He casts out <laughs> demons. He then escapes from the crowd and even his own disciples for some quiet contemplation and prayer. And when his disciples find him, he says in verse 38, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. So this is the purpose of Jesus' ministry in his own words. Jesus and John are not the only preachers in Mark. When Jesus calls his first disciples in verses 16 through 20 in chapter 1, he calls fishermen and offers to make them fishers of men. And then in chapter 3, when the full list of Jesus' 12 chosen apostles is given, it says in verse 14, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. After Jesus' death and resurrection, the Great Commission is recorded in Mark chapter 16, 15, and 16, in which the disciples are instructed to go and preach the gospel to every creature. And we remain under this commission today. We're supposed to carry on this work. So it should be no surprise that the first and one of them only really two sections in Mark that are dedicated to the teaching of Jesus should center around preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little while this evening. The first parable extends, it's the only parable that Jesus explains directly in Mark's gospel. And of course it extends from verses 3 down through 20, the parable and the explanation. It's probably the most familiar uh, of the parables that are contained in Mark to us. Maybe the most familiar of all of Jesus' parables. This is, again, the only parable that Jesus explains directly. And he also, he tells the disciples here why he spoke in parables in verses 10 through 12. And that's uh, a lesson for another time. I may uh, explain that in a little more detail on Saturday night. I'm not sure yet, but... It has to do with the rebellious and idolatrous hearts in the history of the Israelites, the reason why he chooses to do his teaching in parables. Even though Jesus doesn't explain most of his parables, we can understand them today because as Paul taught in Colossians chapter 1, the mystery is revealed in light of the cross. Anytime you see the word mystery in the New Testament, it's something that's being revealed in that immediate context most of the time. Uh, if not in that immediate context, it's been revealed elsewhere in the New Testament. Everything has been made plain. Everything has been made clear in light of the cross. The disciples at the time didn't have the full revelation of God's purpose and plan, but now we do. So on this side of the cross, it's much easier for us to go back and understand what Jesus meant than it was for them then. So let's talk about this first parable, the, par the parable of the sower and what the message is. Uh, out of this first parable. First, I want to note the statement of clarification in verse 14. The sower sows the word. That's important. That's important to understand. This is an illustration for evangelism, for sharing the word of God. That's what Jesus is trying to uh, describe here, to illustrate. When we share the gospel, we're going to have mixed results. Some people will not embrace God's will and provide fruit for him. Some people will. That's the overarching message, really, of this first parable. 
The different types of people that we'll encounter are illustrated by the four kinds of soil. And y'all are probably familiar with all of these. First you have uh, the wayside soil. This is ground that has been packed down because people have been walking up, uh, on it and packing in the dirt. And so the dirt becomes too hard for seed that's just cast out by hand to penetrate. So the seed never penetrates and just lies there on the surface until the birds, which are representative of Satan, Jesus says, come and eat it before it can germinate. When we sow the seed of the word, when we preach the gospel to people, share the good news about Jesus Christ and what he accomplished, some people's hearts are just hard. And they will refuse to allow the word of God to enter and convict them. In fact, probably most people would fit in this category. When the seed falls on this type of soil, it doesn't germinate, it doesn't grow, it doesn't produce fruit. All right, second type of soil that Jesus talks about is the rocky soil, the stony ground. Rocky soil has some good dirt on the surface, but the soil's not very deep. It's got rocks underneath. Y'all probably got a lot of rocky soil around here. Uh, my grandparents live in north central Arkansas, and they grow more rocks than anything. They try to uh, plant a garden or anything like that. Uh, they just keep producing rocks. I don't know where they're coming from. One way or another, uh, they're producing rocks. When the seed is cast out on rocky soil, it penetrates the soil because there is some good ground there on the top. And it germinates and it begins to grow, but because of the rocks underneath, it can't grow, grow a good, strong root system. When the sun beats down, its roots are unable to obtain the nutrients necessary to keep it alive, so it dies. Sometimes, when we sow the word of God, people accept it. They listen to the will of God, but they don't really allow it to take root in their hearts. They have a surface level faith, but they don't have any depth of faith. They're not committed to growth uh, in any way, and per perhaps, therefore, they don't go on to study, or they neglect prayer, or for some other reason, uh, trials arise later on and they are tempted and they have to face some kind of hardship because of their new faith they don't have the strength that they need to face it so they stumble and fall allow their faith to die they leave the church and they return to the world and the end result here is the same as with the wayside soil so even though uh, the seed is sown and it does germinate in rocky soil the result, the end result is the same. No fruit is produced for God. All right, third type of soil is thorny ground. This is ground where uh, it's it's really good ground. It has the capability of producing uh, good plants, good fruits, but. On this ground, as the seed is sown, it penetrates the earth, it germinates, it begins to grow, and then you discover that there's other seed that's planted in the ground. There's thorns that are planted in amongst the good seed, and the thorns, uh, they grow up and they choke out the good plants, the plants that you want, and they compete for resources, and the good plants, the Word of God, ends up uh, being choked out, being out-competed. When the word <coughs> is sown among thorns, the individual will accept it, allow it to grow, even develop some depth of faith, but they don't prioritize it as they should. They don't cultivate the word of God, they cultivate the cares of this world in their hearts. Um, when they should be cultivating their faith, they allow worldly riches, and they're sinful, or even perhaps they're innocent, but temporal desires to compete with spiritual matters for first priority in their lives. Now, we got a lot of people in the church who have thorns growing in their hearts. This is something that everybody needs to think about 
You need to apply, take this principle and apply it to your own life. Weed out the thorns. Don't want to be consumed by your job or your hobbies or Netflix or video games or whatever the case may be. Football, social media, uh, there's various thorns that we've allowed to take serious root in our hearts as members of the church. And that's fine. It's all right to enjoy football as long as you don't allow it to choke out the Word of God, as long as you don't allow it to dominate your life. You need to cultivate the Word of God in your heart, and you need to produce fruit. Thorny ground doesn't produce fruit for God. And therefore, the end result is the same as the wayside soil, where the seed never even penetrated or germinated. So finally, though, there's the good ground. Into which the seed does penetrate, it does germinate, it develops a, a good strong root system where it's able to withstand uh, the sun, the hot sun, and the uh, storms, and uh, it's never choked out by thorns or uh, other competing plants, it ends up producing fruit. When the word is sown in good ground, honest hearts, looking for the truth, people who genuinely desire to do the will of God, it develop, it uh, grows, it develops, and it produces fruit through the individual spiritual growth of the recipient, through their good deeds, and through their own sharing of the gospel in turn. Some produce more fruit than others. Jesus makes that clear. But that's just stated matter-of-factly here, and there's, there's no judgment uh, cast upon someone who produces less fruit point is that good ground pr produces good fruit. And so, uh, that's the key difference between the good soil and the three previous types of uh, soil. Fruit is produced. Alright. When we preach on this parable, we tend to focus on these first three types of soil. And we warn people not to be wayside soil, not to be rocky soil, not to be thorny green. But, I don't think that, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with really focusing on those first three types. It's a really practical way to preach this parable. But I also don't think that's really Jesus' focus here. I think Jesus is trying to uh, make the point to the disciples that there's still hope despite all the opposition that he has faced and that he will face throughout his ministry there's good ground out, out there that's the real message of this parable so I'm going to try to tie all of these parables together as we go through chapter 4 and uh, in order to help us to kind of keep track of the message of each of these successive par parables I'm going to build a paragraph that I think will kind of sum up the, the message of this section. And I'll begin with uh, the message of this first <coughs> parable. There is good ground out there. In verses 21 through 25, let's continue on. Also, he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Now Jesus has just stated that he speaks in parables so that some don't understand him. But here he clarifies that this is not going to continue forever. Mysteries are meant to be revealed. And following his death and resurrection, the apostles will receive 
the full revelation, which, of course, they wrote down, and we have today in the form of the Bible. Here, he also here cautions them to be careful and dutiful in their pursuit of the truth. If they work and improve and, and use what they've been given to the glory of God, they will be exceedingly blessed. But if they refuse, even what they have will be taken away from them. Building off the previous parable, I think it would be appropriate to say here that Jesus is telling the disciples to accept the word, allow it to grow in their hearts, and produce fruit. Everything that we have that's good came from God. If I can speak, I should speak to God's glory because he gave me that ability. If I can read and study, I should read and study his word because he gave me that ability, and that's what he wants me to do. My life itself is a gift from God, and so I live my life for him. The disciples will later be tasked with sharing God's completed revelation of his plan with the world around them, so in the word. Jesus uses this same illustration to refer to our responsibility to reflect God's glory to the world around us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Well, there he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So by living as we are and sharing the good news of the kingdom of God, we produce fruit on his behalf and we cause others to glorify him. Here's your lamp. What are you going to do with it? You're going to hide it under the bed? No, take it out and use it to produce fruit for God. So, message of the first two parables. There's good ground out there, so sow the word. Take what God has given you and use it on his behalf. Now, verses 26 through 29. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. And should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Now, when a man sows the seed, when he sows the word of God, he is limited in his responsibilities and his abilities. And that's important to understand. That's a, that's a really significant point that a lot of people miss and they get discouraged as a result of that. We can't make the seed grow. We can cultivate the soil. We can plant it. We can try and keep the weeds out, try to keep uh, the water to it and make sure... Uh, that it has everything that it needs, but we can't cause it to grow. We can't make it grow. God does that. When a farmer plants a crop, he doesn't stand out in the field, reach down into the ground and pull the plants up one by one by himself. He plants his crop, he waters it, he weeds the garden, and then he goes home, goes to sleep, and trusts God to do the rest. He's got to be patient. He doesn't have a choice in that. All he can do is sow and try to cultivate a favorable environment for growth. Likewise, when we sow the word, we are limited in our ability. We can't make somebody accept it. We can't alter the seed and expect to be able to make it grow even in unfavorable conditions either. A lot of people, uh, they think that the word of God is ineffective because they uh, evangelize, they they use it and people don't accept it and so their solution is well let's change things about God's word let's change the requirements that are contained therein maybe we'll get more people to accept it that way more people will come to church if we uh, don't preach this aspect so much and we just focus on love or whatever uh, and they're not actually 
for one thing, they're not sowing the word when they do that, but uh, they're not producing fruit for God. The, uh, whatever they do grow, it doesn't grow to the glory of God. Um, we All we can do, we can sow the word, and we trust that it will grow in those good hearts as God intended. And this requires patience on our part as well, just like it requires patience on the part of the farmer. Sometimes it takes years and years for the word to germinate in somebody's heart and grow and produce fruit. And a lot of seed is going to grow on, is going to fall on unfavorable ground too. And try as we might, we may not be able to cultivate it. And it'll get discouraging. But ultimately, I think this is an encouraging message. Our responsibility is to sow the word. If we do that, the earth will yield crops, fruit will be produced, and eventually the harvest will come. So if we were going to sum up uh, this parable in a sentence, continue our line of thought, I'd say do your job. If I can spell it, I'm from Mississippi, and I was homeschooled too all the way through the 12th grade. I know that's hard to believe. But anyway, do your job. God's going to do his. God's going to do his. Finally, we'll conclude with the parable of mustard seed in verses 30 through 32. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs. And shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables he spoke the word to them that they were able to hear. Without a parable he did not speak to them. When they were alone he explained all things to his disciples. Now a mustard seed, it's about uh, one or two millimeters in diameter. It's an extremely small, just a, a minute seed, just a little bitty round thing. And it's not literally the smallest seed that there is. Uh, that's a bit of a hyperbolic statement, which is common in the New Testament. And it's very common in that culture, culture of Jesus' day. But it is incredibly small, given the size of the plant it produces. There, there are reports of mustard plants being as much as 12 feet high. That, that's a big old herb to come from just a little bitty, a one millimeter in diameter seed. It's kind of crazy to think when you see a little seed like that that it could produce such a great plant. Something that seems so small can, will, in the right circumstances, grow into something very significant indeed. The kingdom of God might at times seem, seem insignificant. We can apply this in many different ways. We, we might refer, since we're talking about a kingdom here, to how the reign of Christ seems pretty insignificant in light of the evil that abounds in this world. I just heard a preacher just uh, a couple of weeks ago, or a little while ago, uh, he was preaching, he's talking about uh, how he looks around and sees the wickedness and the sin that's rampant in the world around us, and he thinks maybe demons still have power today. Maybe they're still uh, out in the world today. I don't agree with that. That's a lesson for another time. But the point is, you look out into the world, you see how wicked people are and how uh, dominant sin and evil is, and you might think, well, Christ's reign is pretty insignificant. He's not uh, got a whole lot of territory out in the world around us. It sure doesn't seem like it. We might talk about how the church is very small in number and it doesn't seem like it's going to grow exponentially anytime soon Maybe, I, I don't know what y'all think about that but it, it really doesn't seem to me like the church of Christ is in any danger of converting most of the world within my lifetime anyway uh, Jesus himself said the way of life is narrow and few are going to find it uh, so I don't think that that's an inappropriate outlook to have we could even apply this on an individual level and say that sometimes we might think that someone is beyond hope and could never be made to produce fruit for God. 
But once the good news of the kingdom takes hold, once the word germinates in their heart, it grows and it produces. And who knows who will become great soldiers of the cross. It's probably appropriate to apply this in all those ways. Each of these principles is <coughs> Sin abounds. Certainly. There's no denying that fact. But Christ still reigns. And he has taken away the power of death for all who believe in him and align themselves with his kingdom. The church is small. Certainly. We're few in number. But if we're serving God as we ought to be, we're growing in our knowledge of him and our love for each other in unity. Even when we aren't growing in number. And we're a more significant force than we think. And in eternity, we'll be vindicated by God in the presence of all. And we'll glorify him and be glorified by him, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I reckon, while we might feel insignificant now, when we're in the presence of God being glorified by him, we'll feel pretty significant. Untold throngs of people fail to appreciate the power of the Word of God. They don't think it can produce as it was intended to. So they build gymnasiums and develop programs and put in smoke systems and whatever else they can do to get people to come to church and act like Christians besides preaching the truth. But preaching the truth is the only way that will ever produce fruit for God. And if you do sow the Word, it will produce. It's powerful. However you want to apply this, par this parable, I think we can summarize these last few verses and complete our summary of this section with this knowledge. Sum up the message of these parables. There's good ground out there. Despite the fact there's a lot of bad ground out there, there's still some good ground out there. So let's take what God has given us and go out and sow the word. If we do our part, God's going to do his, and the kingdom will grow. I want you all to think about whether or not you're fulfilling your obligation to evangelize. Many folks don't uh, really do a very good job in this area because they're scared of being put in uncomfortable situations or they're afraid they might face some negative social consequences uh, as a result of confronting people with the good news of Jesus and what he accomplished for us. Some don't uh, fulfill their obligations to God in this area because they're too preoccupied with other things to work for the Lord. They got thorns growing in their hearts that prevent them from producing fruit. And that may be you. Some people neglect this responsibility just because they're discouraged. They think it's no use. It's hopeless. If you neglect your responsibility to evangelize because you don't think there's any point, you're wrong. And you'll answer to God for that to God one day. Sower sows the word and you're the sower. Every one of y'all. So get out there and cast it out. There's good ground left in this world. And anybody who says differently is dead wrong and ought to be rebuked for it. So sow the seed. You can't make it grow. But if you sow it, God will give the increase. Fruit will be produced. The kingdom will grow. If you're subject to the gospel call this evening, please uh, come believing, repenting, confessing, and we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins and you can become a child of God, someone who will eventually produce fruit for God. If you are a member of the church, perhaps you've got thorns growing in your heart and you've got something else that's preventing you from producing fruit and you'd like the congregation to know about it, then please come to me as we stand.